Hi all, Rick here. Done talking about dying lithium because apparently that is a controversial topic that gets some people saltier than the salt lamps themselves. So instead, let's take a break from the workings of a starship's propulsion system and instead look into a recreational device that we'd all readily abuse, the holodeck. Although, I'd say that although holodecks are indeed recreational, they are 100% necessary on most Starfleet ships. Being confined to artificial environments made up of regulated air, constant internal temperature, ceilings everywhere you go, repeating corridors, and a very finite amount of room surrounded by the infinite wall of space is not exactly healthy for the mind. Especially species who evolved and grew up on planetary surfaces, which is like 99% of everyone in Trek especially deep space explorer vessels that are expected to probably maintain long stints away from amiable M-class worlds, such as the galaxy Intrepid and Titan classes. Things like the Defiant could have indeed benefited from the inclusion of holodecks. However, they were primarily battleships, expected to operate either as part of a fleet, in which case another vessel could provide recreational activities, or they routinely reported back to installations for repair, resupply, and R&R. The holodeck as a technology is, in my opinion, the ultimate endpoint for gaming to achieve. A fully interactive and responsive fictional environment with immersion hampered only by your knowledge that it's not real. No screens, no clumsy headsets that take half an hour or so to set up, and no controller bound to your hands. During Starfleet's time under the United Earth, holodecks were in their infancy and not a part of a ship's equipment, but after a hundred years of development and the formation of the United Federation of Planets, rec rooms were installed on most Starfleet ships and were essentially holodecks. Holographic technology at the time was in common use with even communications systems, which I can only assume was a fad that eventually faded, although apparently it was also replete with errors. When used as real-time communication, for example, the USS Enterprise under Pike's command removed its hollow communications systems because it even caused a ship-wide power failure. So that particular application of technology was reduced until around the 2370s, but let's rein in the tangent. Holodecks in the 23rd century were more rudimentary, although they could simulate the look of other environments. There is some question as to their interactivity and immersion in other areas, such as feel, smell, and even taste. And nevertheless, it shows a significant leap forwards in the designs. By the mid-24th century, the holographic chambers were far, far more advanced and capable of simulating environments and vistas complete with all the other immersive sensory effects. But more impressively, the level of programming and processing power behind the scenes had improved vastly. Holodecks by this stage were adaptive and capable of forming complex scenarios with relatively little input based on interpretation and loose parameters. You could ask for a wood table and get one, without a programmer having to sculpt one from scratch. Instead, the computer would generate a design based on its records. There's even more going on behind the scenes with 24th century holodecks than may first appear too. Have you ever wondered how two people can wander half a mile apart in a holodeck, despite it only being a 10 meter squared room? So let's take a look at how they work. A holodeck's walls are filled with OHDs, omnidirectional hollow diodes. These are projectors that fire out both light and force fields upon which to project it. Tailoring the force field to the canvas, if you like, to a particular shape, then shading with the emitted light. Here, the simulation can get a little creative in how it saves memory and power when forming this. For example, for a spectacular view, it can simply project an image on its own walls, no need for a force field, and perhaps even distant objects needn't be rendered in full. This happens all the time in video games. The zone behind the door you just closed is probably unloaded to save space, so it may be the same in a holodeck. This is 
already an impressive level of technological achievement. To have an environment rendered in real time, capable of shifting perspective based on the user's location requires no small amount of processing power and memory resources on the computer's end. This is also why our holodex systems are frequently separate from the ship's other power and computing resources. Typically, not always. As for moving beyond the supposed confines of the holodeck once you are enclosed within it, well in this case, the computer can simply project a force field floor for you to walk on, and then slide it around as you move. So in reality, you are walking on the spot, like on a treadmill. Just one that is responding instantly to your movements so as not to disorientate you. They get even more impressive when another person enters the holodeck. In this case, the system is now tailoring the view to the perspective of several people. Easy enough to do when they are stood next to one another, but if they split up, then the computer has to get tricksy. At this stage, if two individuals travel away from each other in program, about a hundred meters, well, clearly they are limited by the real dimensions of the holodeck, but that would break the immersion. So instead, it treadmills the floor, as mentioned earlier, and shifts the imagery for each individual, altering the perspective for both parties. This happens even to the extent that should person 1 look back to person 2, a false perspective is even projected in between them to give the appearance of 100 meters of distance, despite in reality they are only a fraction of that apart. Clever use of sound manipulation, probably also done with force fields or something, and the illusion is complete. So that is a lot for the holodeck to keep track of, and in my opinion, the far more impressive feat of engineering than simply generating an image by itself. During the development of holodecks, some bright spark also had the idea to involve transporter and replicator technology too. Interactive objects within a program can also be synthesized in full to by replicators hidden among the walls. This is all part of another subsystem of the holodeck, the matter conversion subsystem. Basically, select objects within grabbing distance of the user, such as a tankard of ale or a book on a shelf, are not in fact illusions, but are real objects generated from replicator programs stored in memory in the same way a replicator does this. Usually, the computer, always reading the user's movements, detects when they make a move towards an object and then subtly replicates the object as they reach for it within the hollow shell of light that is the hologram. By the time their hand closes around the tankard, it is filled with the actual replicated drink in an actual container. These objects are also desynthesized as they leave the user's proximity unless programmed otherwise, I guess. This is why some things, such as snowballs and water, have been seen to leave the holodeck and not despawn, while others do. Additionally, clothing and such can be created over the user, probably through the matter conversion system too, but many elect to don a program appropriate outfit before entry to a holodeck, which is probably both for fun and I imagine it does help with the immersion, not to feel like you're wearing several layers of clothing over your uniform. It's likely too that this system of microtransporters and replicators is also responsible for extracting undesirable or unhygienic elements from the holodeck. I mean, sports programs are going to generate sweat, aren't they? And it's only natural for the matter conversion system to want to extract such contaminants from the holodeck and store them to be disposed of later. It deals with all sorts of waste too, which I'm not going to elaborate on. There is also the Arch, which is a system incorporated to most holodecks where an easily identifiable holographic arch of a computer control panel is created next to where the actual exit is. This helps an individual to easily locate the exit without terminating the program and alter the parameters of the program or gain access to the outside systems, again without interrupting the holo program in session. Holo programs themselves are governed by safety protocols with various levels of constraints, 
such as rendering dangerous objects inert and even taking care to despawn hazards. I wonder what a holodeck safety test looks like. <laughs> Do you think it's someone's job to actually test programs by actively attempting to harm themselves in a holodeck, throwing themselves at all the furniture to see if they bruise? That being said, many holo programs, especially those that involve a high degree of physical activity, can't really be done without some degree of danger. For example, you can still fall while skiing and twist an ankle, or even take an actual punch from a holographic boxer or one of Worf's combat programs. They just won't kill you. So that is my rundown of how a holodeck works, and I hope I have conveyed the level of sheer computing ingenuity and power that goes on behind the scenes. I haven't even touched on the complexity of the simulated personalities that a well-written holo program can create, or even the idea that the computer can basically create an approximation of a personality based on information it has access to. That's nuts. But considering the level of trickery and detail a holodeck can conjure to create an immersive and responsive environment to begin with, it's about on par with what I'd expect from the holodecks. All I know is that a holodeck would be an excellent way to run a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. I've been Rick, thanks for watching this video on the lore of the holodeck and its hidden workings. I'll see you next time for another sci-fi video and until then, computer? End program.